Blessed is God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Job took a potsherd with him, which to scrape himself, and sat among the ashes. 
Then his wife said to him, Do you still persist in your integrity? Curse God and die. But he said to her, You speak as any foolish woman would speak. Shall we receive the good at the hand of God and not receive the bad? In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. Hear what the Holy Spirit is saying to God's people. Thanks be to God. I will praise you. 
hear what the Holy Spirit is saying to God's people. As I reflected on these readings for this week, two thoughts kept coming to my mind. One, it is very easy to believe some things. And second, it's very easy to deny some things. Even if some of those things that you're denying are part of Holy Scripture. Now that may sound heretical, but I have a further thought that came to me, and that's that sometimes our faith is made stronger by the things that we deny. 
That's a lot that I laid on you. Let me unpack it a little bit. Starting with things that are easy to deny. These thoughts came to me about our readings this week because there are some very difficult things in them. But those things that are easy to deny are always mixed with things that we believe. Because belief is the foundation, the floor of, the, of everything that we do and say, even the things that we deny. It's always a mixture of both. But when I talk about denying things, I'm not talking about doubts or things that are hard to believe. I've shared with you in the past my favorite definition of doubts that comes from Frederick Buechner, who said that doubts are like the ants in the pants of faith. They keep it alive and moving. Buechner was saying that in our doubts, if they are honest doubts, there are always possibilities of listening, of openness, that we can, through those doubts, discover some real truth, that they will lead to faith because of this openness to possibility. That's doubts. Other things are just hard to believe because they're totally outside of anything we've ever experienced. And we have a wonderful example of that among those early disciples, and that's the resurrection of Jesus. Sure, they had seen the, in our readings for today the story of the son of the widow of Nain who was raised by Jesus from death to life. The raising of Lazarus. But for this man with whom they walked, who they saw put to death on the cross to suddenly come back to life was hard to believe. Could this be? Is it even possible? Those are different things, those doubts and those hard to believe from things that are easy to deny. And among the first of the things that are easy to deny in today's scripture reading comes from the book of Job. This wisdom story, as it was explained to you in the introduction to the reading today, where Job finds himself the subject of bargaining. Bargaining between God and Satan in this story. It's almost like God is one of those gambling ads that we see constantly on television. Hey, I got a great thing here for you, God. I can just hear Satan saying that. Here's a sure thing for you. This guy, Job, is never going to live up to what you're saying about him. Regardless of whether it happened that way or not, this picture presents God being more concerned with pleasing Satan than with looking after the well-being of Job. Or to extend it to our time, that God is more concerned with other things than with our well-being. Then the story goes on to talk about God and allowing Satan to test Job. A lot of people would say that we're tested by God. I don't think we're tested by God. I think it's the circumstances of life that test us. The pains of life, the difficulties that we have. Some of us were sharing some of those things this morning in our Bible study of how difficult some things in life can be moving to a different place, giving up a beloved pet, death of a loved one. But there are things that happen in life. It's not God testing us. 
The main point for me in all of this is not these things, but that the picture being presented of God as this bargaining individual, as not caring for human beings, is not something that I think is true. And I deny it because the bigger picture that I see in scriptures goes far beyond this. Martin Luther said that when we approach scripture, we ought to look at the totality of the message of scripture. What is the total message of scripture saying to us? Not any one individual passage. And the overall message of scripture is of a God who cares for us, who has created us out of God's great love for us, and who sustains us and cares for us continuously. It is a loving God, not a manipulative God, such as presented in that book of Job, but a God who cares for us and who tells us that we are God's beloved. The second thing in scripture today that's easy for me to deny is what I read in scripture about what to, supposedly Jesus said about divorce and remarriage. That those who do this have committed adultery. One of the realities of the law in those days was that Jewish law refused to allow women the right to be an offended party in adultery. Women couldn't claim adultery. Only men had this privilege. But in Roman law, the Roman civil law, both men and women could claim this right of seeking divorce because of adultery of the other party. And that says to me that this story really comes from a later time, not Palestinian time, but from Greco-Roman time in later life. And I could deny it on this basis. But again, I deny it because it is not a picture of God as I experience God in Scripture. I experience a loving God who is forgiving of all the errors that we make in life willing to put up with our human mistakes. A God who will forgive us again and again. A God who puts no limits on forgiving. When Peter came to Jesus with a question, Lord, how many times do I have to forgive somebody who's really a pain to me? Seven times? That's a magic number for Jewish people in those days. Jesus said, no, not seven times, but seven times 70, or infinite, endless forgiveness, never ending forgiveness. Now, if God in Christ expected that kind of forgiveness of human beings, I think God's forgiveness is even greater. Not just infinite, beyond any idea we have of infinite forgiveness, even to the quote that was given to Jesus that uh, people say, are any sins not forgiven? And we're told in scripture that Jesus said, those who sin against the Holy Spirit that cannot be forgiven. And I have trouble with that as well. I wonder if God can forgive Judas, this God of infinite forgiveness. Can God forgive Hitler? Can God forgive the worst of human beings in any of means? All of the people who bring horror and terror to God's world? Are they beyond God's forgiveness? 
These are questions I have as I look at these readings, and especially this reading from the Gospels, that this sin of adultery that's laid on people just because of the human mistake they made in life, in marriage, and divorce, and remarriage. That's one of the reasons the Episcopal Church changed what it was, its whole viewpoint on divorce was. Many years ago, shortly after I was ordained, back when I was first ordained, people who were divorced and remarried were expected to be excommunicated from the church, barred from the communion, much as happens today in the Roman Catholic Church. And I think every clergy person I knew in those days ignored that little bit of canon law, and we excommunicated no one or allowed that rule of excommunication to apply to no one, especially because we knew that in moments of pain and difficulty in their life that divorce caused, they really needed the communion, just as we do in our weakness. But there are other points in scripture that I said are easy to believe. And one of them is that magnificent statement that was the opening of our reading from Hebrews that I read read to us. Where we are told that in those days, God has spoken to us by a son whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he also created the world. He is the reflection of God's glory and the exact imprint, the clone, if you will, of God's very being. And he sustains everything by his powerful word. That is, to me, Martin Luther's central message of scripture that this Christ who joined in the creation of the word as the word of God, creation of the world as the word of God, is present to us in a forgiving, loving way and sustains all things by his powerful word. I think it's significant that immediately after that story of <clears throat> divorce and adultery, Little children were brought to Jesus, and the disciples, not wanting to see Jesus wasting his time with little children, tried to send them away. And Jesus said, don't do this, for in them is the kingdom of God. And anyone who receives a child in my name receives I think he was really saying, these little children are like all of my children. They are dearly beloved by God and never to be turned away. No matter what happens in their life, no matter what mistakes they might make, no matter how far they may drift from me at one point or the other, they are my beloved. prayed in our psalm these words, your love is before my eyes, and it's that love of Jesus that is before our eyes that is the central message of scripture, and that is very easy.
Friends, please join with me as you are able and standing and join with me in our statement of faith, the church's statement in the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father of all might, great for heaven and earth, of all places and seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, God from God. In peace, we pray to you, Lord God. For all people in their daily life and work. For our families, friends, and for those who are those who are For Joe, our president, Eric, our governor, Thomas, our mayor, this community, the nation, and the world. For all who are For the homeless, unemployed, or underemployed, and for the just and proper use of your creation. For the victims of hunger, justice, and oppression. For those who are hospitalized, those in convalescent centers, Judith Austin, Nevada, <coughs> Sonia Hurley, Barbara Moffat, Elva Mullen, and Carol Smalley. Those who work to protect us, including the police, firefighters, and emergency personnel of our communities. Our men and women in the armed forces, Audrey McMillan Cole, Chastain Gardner, Jessica Halliday, Brandon Hallowell, Greg, Chaz Hewlett, Micah Jones, Chris Call, Brian Casper, Amanda Conover McAllister, Melissa Payne, Nathan Payne, Reed Ratzlaff, Travis Reed, Allison Woodruff, Ethan Loesch, and Zach Webb. And for all who are in danger, sorrow, or any kind of trouble. For those who minister to the sick, and For the peace and unity of the Church of God. For all who are in danger, sorrow, or any kind of trouble. For Michael, our presiding bishop. Jennifer, our bishop, Bill, our priest in charge. For our companion dioceses, Brasilia and their bishop Maurizio, Bor in the Sudan and their bishop Ruben, the people of Haiti and their bishop Zashe. For the church in Wales in our Anglican cycle of prayer. For our diocese partners, St. Francis in the Fields, Zionsville, the Reverend C. Davies Reed, the Reverend Alan Wallace, for all the baptized and for all bishops and other ministers, for all, all the, 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 the church, 
for the special needs and concerns of this congregation, including those on our printed prayer list. Hear us, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for all the blessings of this life. For this parish community, all in our life, and our daily prayer list for this day, for Sherry Ballinger, Robert and Diane Bats, and Paul Baylor. We pray for those who celebrate birthdays or anniversaries this week, including Janet Nick on October 6th, and for Rick Foley on October 9th. We pray today for Sherry Ballinger, Robert and Diane Vance, and Paul Baylor on our daily prayer list. We will exalt you, O God, our King. And praise your name forever and ever. We pray for those in whose memory altar flowers have been given today by Mr. and Mrs. William Webler in loving memory of Florence Kaler on her birthday today and by Mr. Ron Olden in loving memory of Marilyn Olden. And for all who have died, including Henry Con Conley and Dick Lightfoot, that they may have a place in your eternal kingdom. Lord, let your loving kindness be upon them. We pray to you also for the forgiveness of our sins. Have mercy upon us, O merciful Father. In your compassion, forgive us our sins. No, 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 no. Things done and left And so, and so uphold us by your Spirit, that we may live and serve you in the of life, to the honor and glory of your name. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you and me. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Sisters and brothers, the peace of the Lord is always with you. And also with you. present the offerings and the blessings of our life and labor to God. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
As we gather at this one table of our Lord, we will use Eucharistic Prayer B that begins on page 367. The Lord is with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. Through Jesus <laughs> Christ our Lord, who on this first day of the week overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. <laughs> Christ, 
and bring us to that heavenly country where with Francis and Claire of Assisi, Birgitta of Sweden, and all your saints, we may enter the everlasting heritage of your sons and daughters. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church and the author of our salvation, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, gifts of God for the people of God, holy gifts for God's holy people.
Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And you have fed us for spiritual food and the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart through Christ our Lord. May God give us grace to follow Francis, Claire, Bergia, and all of God's saints in faith and hope and love. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen.
and even a photograph on phone that is good enough. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. Let us go in peace, rejoicing in the power of Christ with us. Thanks be to God.